we're going to get into sexual selection here. And this is something that confused Darwin. He was looking around at all these birds, and he saw these birds with things like the peacock. Peacock's a great example of this. He's got this big tail. It takes up a lot of space. It's a lot of energy and resources that are put into making this tail and making sure that it is beautiful. And to what end? Why would you do this? If anything, you're doing nothing but making yourself a bigger target so that if, an, you know, if a cat or an animal comes in that wants to eat peacocks, it's easier to find you. Why would you do this? And he found out, he determined that there is basically a second form of selection beyond natural selection, which we know Darwin for, and that is sexual selection. And he defined it as struggle between individuals of one sex for the possession of the other sex. The result is not death to the unsuccessful competitor, but just few or no offspring. Basically, you just don't get to live on as a result of that. So let's look at classifying sexual selection. Intrasexual means within the same sex. So individuals of the same sex compete with one another. Obviously, male-male happens a lot, but this can happen female-female as well, and in varying ways. With male-male competition particularly, but with both as well, we have to do, we do, do need to specify some certain areas. When can this happen? This can happen before the male and female even mate. Dominance over one another for access to the females. Control of territories to prevent that, etc., etc. Post-copulatory. There's what's called sperm competition. We're going to get into that. It's a little bit more of an adult topic. And then post-zygotic um, induced abortion or infant side, which we've talked about a little bit already. So you can, you know, do some things to compete after the fact as well. Intersexual make choice is between sexes. And so we make choice is pretty much what it all boils down to. You're looking for resources. You're looking for territory. You're looking for somebody to protect your offspring and protect you. And also you probably want to find a really good quality person to provide the genes for your offspring as well. And because there's such a big difference in the males and the females, this leads to what's called sexual dimorphism. The word dimorphism, di means two, morph means form or type. So two forms um, that we see here. And I've just put a picture of cardinals because they're a great example of it. Plus we see them around here, here in North Carolina. So we have a female cardinal up here at the top. She's kind of drab. She's not that brightly plumaged, whereas the male is very bright red, um, very characterful. You can see him. That's why you like to see people take pictures of cardinals in like a snowy pine tree because that red against the white background is just so stark. And the fact that he can survive in that type of environment is one way he advertises to the female, I'm a good male. I'm, I'm very obvious, but I'm still here. I have been able to outcompete others. And so we see that with cardinals here in this case. So you know, we see that squirrels can't really tell a male from a female unless it's something like, oh, that female is really, you know, that one's pretty heavy in the belly. That female's probably pregnant, things like that. Yeah, it's probably a female. We can, you know, but squirrels don't really do this, but squirrels don't live in an environment. Well, why? There's reasons why they just wouldn't, don't, they don't need to look different. Uh, Trivers in 1972 came up with what's called parental investment theory of sexual selection. And basically it says that if one sex invests more time and energy per offspring than the other sex, then the high investment sex is not able to reproduce as often as the low investment sex. And thus, the high investment sex will become a limiting resource for the other sex. This is a result of an imbalance in male-female parental imbalance, and this kind of leads back to this. So basically, if the female is not able to reproduce as often, I mean, we just we use humans for an example. Humans carry a baby for nine months. Once a woman gets pregnant, she's not going to get pregnant a second time during those nine months. That male can go off and find other females and impregnate them, but the female cannot do that during this time period. So that's... And I hate to use humans for this because it's an animal behavior course, but it's just an easy example. Same thing goes in organisms. You know, even if it's a six-week gestation period, the male could still go off and impregnate other females as well. So the female loses out on those future chances at this point. This leads to competition over access to mates or mating opportunities because the females have to be more selective. They are the limited resource for most organisms and leads to differential attraction of, um, for the mates. 
In lots of species, the females do invest more time than offspring, and so there is usually intersexual competition more among the males. There is amongst the females too, but mostly against the males, and the females have to be more selective. If the males invest more, then the roles will reverse, and we see this in the family Signethidae. Um, and these are seahorses, sea dragons, pipe fish, I think stickleback fish maybe too. Um, these are ones you probably have heard this before. And if you have not, seahorses, the male is actually the one that's pregnant and carries the babies. And you're like, whoa, wait a second. Well, wouldn't that make it the female? No, the female, the male actually has the sack that carries the eggs. The female lays her eggs in his sack. And so he carries the, the children. So he's the one that carries the offspring until they are born. So if you didn't know that little fact, know it because we'll come back and talk about it a little bit more. But it's it's a great example to say, well, the female always carries the offspring. No, 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 not always. And so in that case, the male becomes the limited resource. You know, so if you think about it from that perspective. Uh, so just to kind of summarize this a little bit real quick here. If one sex invests more per offspring than the other sex, the more invested sex will become a limited resource, typically females. The less invested sex, typically males, will compete with one another to have access to the females or the more invested sex. And the more invested sex, again, typically female, will be more selective in their mate choice. It's what parental investment theory says. And um, here's a black buck uh, amongst his harem or harem, whichever way you want to pronounce that word. But you can see here, I'm assuming they're in an enclosure because you look at that, that log, it's cut off at a, it's been cut obviously by a chainsaw or something. So I'm not sure where this is. I feel like this is probably in, in a zoo or something maybe, but maybe it could be out in the environment and people cut it and they took a picture of it. Who knows? So anyway, if you didn't know anything about seahorses, let's go address that real quick and I'll see you after the click.